After posting the test cuts and steel video, I received a ton of suggestions. So first of all, thank you to everyone that left a comment giving me suggestions on what to try and what was working and what wasn't working. In this video, I'm going to go through some of the more common suggestions that were offered and we'll see if those make a difference and generally just play around with steel some more and see if we can get a reliable recipe. For this test, I'll be using a four flute quarter inch variable helix end mill. It has a titanium aluminum nitride coating and a little bit of a corner radius. So it's not quite the same as the lakeshore that I used in the last video, but it's relatively close. So I had a couple parameters I wanted to test out in this first run. Uh, the first one was cutting dry as opposed to using the mist coolant. Uh, I got conflicting responses to this in the last video. Some folks said, always use any kind of coolant you have, even if it's just mist. Other people said only use flood coolant and if you don't have flood, just cut completely dry. My justification for cutting dry is that I had real problems with chips getting stuck to sidewalls in the last video. Uh, the minimal mist was just enough to kind of glue chips down and prevent the air blast from evacuating them. The main changes are to the cutting parameters themselves. So a lot of people had very good comments in the last video about how it was not quite using the spindle to its fullest capacity, being a high-speed spindle. I should be using high-speed machining techniques with low radial and high depth of cuts. And I was not really doing that in the last one. And especially as I tried to tune the parameters, I was working my way away from optimal parameters by doing larger step overs and slower and slower speed. If you look at the power and torque curves of these high-speed spindles, uh, you'll see that, for example, my spindle reaches maximum power at 18,000 RPM. And so the slower you go, you still have constant torque, but the power falls off kind of linearly towards zero. So for this test, I put it at 18,000 RPM, kind of maximum power of my spindle. And then I wanted to keep the feed rate below 200 inches a minute for various reasons I'll talk about later. Uh, so with some fiddling, I came up with 150 inches per minute, half inch depth of cut, and a 5% radial. So the surface speed is definitely on the high end. Mild steel would be much happier around, say, 600 feet per minute, and this is all the way up at nearly 1,200. So from what I gather, a high surface footage basically means that I'll be causing more heat in the cut and reducing tool life. So that's kind of the trade-off I might have to make on a high-speed spindle. So it feels like this recipe is moving in the right direction. There's definitely some issues to work on and some programming mistakes on my part, but I feel like it's moving towards a good, reliable recipe that removes material quickly enough and also doesn't try to destroy my machine. I'll go ahead and fast forward to the rest of it. We do some 2D contours to clean up the sides, both inside and outside, and then a horizontal to polish the flat surfaces. Far and away, the most common suggestion was, hey, use conventional milling. And you know, they have a really good point. My machine is not super rigid, and conventional tends to work well for machines that have backlash. Here I have ball screws, so I shouldn't really be getting that, but because of the lack of rigidity, the deflection in the frame from cutting forces will probably look like backlash to the cutter. It becomes immediately obvious in this pocket that you're cutting conventional though. If you notice, all the chips are piling up in the front of the pocket in front of the cutter, which, you know, of course is what happens when you're milling conventionally. It's one of those things you know happens, but you don't really think about until you actually see it. And in this case, the deep pocket and the relatively small chips and lack of probably sufficient air blast means all these chips are piling up right by the cutter, which kind of worries me. Well, I'd love to blame this on conventional, but I think this is a programming mistake. This bar is just roughly cut on the bandsaw, and in Fusion, I didn't add any extra tolerances on the stock. Basically, the end mill met a lot more 
material than I was expecting. But the show must go on, and I had another end mill I want to test. So this is a high feed end mill from Lakeshore, and it's something that I've been interested in for a while. So high feed mills are kind of the opposite of what I was just doing. You use very, very shallow depths of cut and high radial up to 100% engagement. Because the geometry is designed for these very shallow depths, most of the forces are transmitted directly up into the spindle. So at least in theory, this could be really good for not so rigid machines because all the forces are in a relatively advantageous direction. A notable downside is that because you're taking such shallow passes, you have to go very, very quickly to even be close to comparable to a normal end mill as far as material removed. Unfortunately, HSM Advisor doesn't seem to like these small high feed mills. If you punch in the recommended parameters for this particular mill, uh, it just starts giving you negative values. So I had to kind of guesstimate. Lakeshore recommends a 15 thou depth of cut and in this case a 3.8 thou chip load. The recommended surface footage is 800 or 1100, which actually works fine for us. We can hit that with 17,000 RPM on our quarter inch end mill. The bigger problem is the feed rate. So it gets into crazy number territories pretty quickly. Uh, I'm at 200 inches per minute, which is about as fast as I want my machine to be running. And if you were to let it go as fast as it should theoretically be running, then we're talking three, 400 inches a minute. So that's really the, the big problem with these high feed is they really want to be fed fast. You know, it's in the name. A couple observations, I think. Since this is taking such tiny passes, the chips are, you know, microscopic and the anxiety factor of this whole operation is relatively low. I wouldn't feel bad walking away from this, coming back, and it'll probably be doing what I left it doing. So that's a, a nice property. Second, I am pretty much positive I don't have this programmed as well as it could be. You know, these high feed, very shallow passes just take a different kind of mental programming model. and. I don't think I probably approached all the toolpaths optimally. So that's something I'll have to learn about in the future. Third, and I think this is most interesting to me, is that we still need a rigid machine to run these end mills correctly. It's not a panacea. Like we don't need the rigidity in the sense that we're resisting tool deflection and cutting forces kind of in a radial direction. But what we do need is rigidity of the frame to accelerate and decelerate quickly and accurately, which is also something that's lacking in a small benchtop router. On paper, a perfect fit for these little router machines. Uh, in practice, probably not so much given the high feed and acceleration required. Finally, and as sort of an addendum that's unrelated to this particular end mill, I noticed sparks coming off one of the pockets uh, about halfway through, and I'm pretty sure the machine lost steps at that point. I've been suspecting missteps at high feeds for a while now uh, in other test cuts that I've done both on and off video. And I think this one pretty much confirmed it because after those sparks were flying, where I think basically we lost a few steps and hit a sidewall more than we had anticipated, the whole rest of the profile was slightly shifted. And you can see this at the end, inspecting the part that the corner radiuses are not correct and things are shifted slightly in the Y direction. So I think my machine is just incapable of running at greater than or equal to 200 inches per minute with my current steppers, even with relatively low load that this end mill produces. But wait, there's more. So I had some more of the variable quarter inch end mills and I just couldn't help myself. I wanted to test out some more climb cutting parameters. I decided to just bail on conventional because it, it maybe sounded a little better, but I didn't like the chips piling up and whatever. Climb for life. The whole goal of this test was to get the surface footage down. I wasn't crazy about how high it was on the first set of tests. And, you know, I'm worried about ruining tool life because it's spinning too fast. So I dropped the RPM down to about 12,000 and adjusted parameters from there. Kept the depth of cut the same. I did increase the step over to 10% because mm, I wanted to see how it would fare, but I suspect it's still too much on this machine. It sounds just okay, in my opinion. It's a little shrieky for my liking, 
and you can definitely hear the spindle bogging down. So 12K and 10% step over with this depth of cut is probably too much for it to handle. Which brings us to the final test. The only changes here are an increase of the surface footage up to 900 and decreasing the step over to 5%. I think this sounds not too bad, and this might be the sort of recipe that I stick with in the future. Uh, if you compare this to the very first test at the beginning of the video, the parameters are relatively similar except for the surface footage being much higher in the first test. I don't think this one sounds much better or worse than the first one, but with a lower surface footage it's closer to where we should be in steel, so we can probably expect tool life to be better. I know folks are interested in repeatability and accuracy with this machine, particularly in steel. Uh, based on my measurements, I was hitting about plus or minus two thou, which, you know, it's okay for my purposes. It might not be if you're wanting to hold tenths all day. Clearly not the machine for you. Accuracy is a little more difficult to pin down. I was doing some step calibration before this video, and I think I might have messed it up. All the features are pretty consistently over by about 16 thou. And just to make sure this wasn't an artifact of cutting in steel, I ran a few test parts in aluminum after this video, and they were also pretty consistently over by the same amount. So I think I just messed up the step calibration. Well, I think that about wraps it up for this video. Thanks again to all the folks that left comments on the last one. I really appreciate the help. And hopefully this helps someone that has a similar machine and looking to dial in some settings to play around in steel. Thanks for watching.